Clifton and I have been talking about the rise of the small church. Keep in mind that 92% of churches in America are under 250 in attendance. Keep in mind that the median size of a church is 65 in average worship attendance. We are a nation. We are a world of churches that, again, Mark cautions us about saying smaller because they're really kind of typical. And he brought up a great point. You know, we don't say that's a small McDonald's or small Starbucks. We just say it's a McDonald's or a Starbucks. And same thing for churches here. But what we're seeing is a new respect for these churches. We're seeing a, uh, a, a new enthusiasm for them. And it's a good movement. And we want to talk about it more. If you missed the previous episode, episode 288, the rise of the small church attitude shifts, go back and listen to it. And don't put it on fast speed. Don't even put it on 1.25. You have to listen to it as Mark Clifton said it. I mean, at normal speed, it was gold nuggets. And if you listen to it too fast, you're going to have diluted gold. So go back and listen to that one. And uh, it's, it's 22 minutes worth your time. We're going to continue to talk about the rise of small church. And uh, I, I'm leading off with the same thing I let off in the previous episode about how businesses and uh, those who understand businesses, there, there's been a micro business revolution where there's an understanding that a business that is located in a community that supports the community, the community that supports it, and it may be a one single owner employee, that's it, it may be smaller, two or three. The micro business revolution was a recognition that that size is really good in the community, even more so for the church, even more so for local congregations. And we want to talk about some reasons why these will be actions. And Mark, the first of these is and in these size churches, one person really can make a difference in a lot of different ways. But I've I've been in those churches. I mean, I've been in I've been in the church where where Van came up to me and wanted to know uh, why people weren't sharing Jesus. And and I said, Van, I don't have a good answer. He says, Well, I'm going to do it. And he did. <laughs> and he did he, he he did some weird things. I mean, there was a sermon where. I ended it and I, I never was a good preacher and some of my endings were unfortunate, but I ended this one with go out and get you someone for Jesus. He took it literally. And the next Sunday he brought someone off the street in a headlock and brought him into the church because he wanted to go get someone for Jesus. And I had to explain to him that it's not exactly what I meant. Well, that's what you said. But that one person was a powerful catalyst in our church. One person, not only in evangelism, but in ministry and a lot of other ways. Power of one of you. I bet you got a few stories on that as well, Mark. Yeah, I think so. I think one of the great things about uh, a normal sized church, and by the way, we talked last time we met, and this is really important to know, that really the term small church, the de definer, the, the designation small church didn't really come into common use until the 1960s and 70s. If you read information about churches in the 1880s and 1920s, they were just churches. They weren't really they were all that size. And uh, so we're, we're just a normal size congregation. And the great, you know, the, the, a church of 100, 120 people, you're known by everybody. Everybody knows you. And if you if, if you have something going on in your life or you have a, a need or you feel uh, an urge to do a ministry or to do something, you can share that with the church. They can they can move quickly. They can help you with do that. They can. I mean, I got so many examples of this. I mean, we have, you know, Wednesday night, we have 15 or 20 people there and someone in our prayer time brings that man. This family needs this over here. And four or five people will just say we can we can do that and we'll just go do it. I mean. It, smaller churches can be so nimble if they will, and they can become so flexible and they can react so much quicker in many ways than large, complicated churches. And it's a place where, like you said, just one person coming in there can really make a huge impact on that church. Uh, kind of like a, I, I'm using sort of a Spurgeon analogy, but you know, he used to say you could be on a big steamship and you could run around, jump up and down, and nobody even know you're on the boat. You get in a canoe and you just shift your weight and everybody feels it. I mean, that's kind of the way it is in a, in a smaller church. You know, you can, you, people can know you're there. Your influence can be much quicker and much more meaningful, if that makes any sense. It, it does. And, Mark, I, I, I can attest to this from an organizational perspective. I currently am CEO of Church Answers. If you add up all of our employees, all of our contractors, everybody – 
that's part of our team, grand total of 31 people. I mean, that's it. I, I never think of Church Answers as small, but I, I think of Church Answers as just a ministry that uh, is is making a difference. But there are 31 of us. However, my previous job was CEO of a company called Lifeway. And at, the, at hmm. its peak, it had 5,650 employees at, my, at the peak when I was there. It took wow. a little more effort to initiate change in that organization <laughs> than it does at Church Answers. For, for example, uh, Chuck Lawless is in my house right now. I don't know if he's listening to this or not, because I'm not. I don't know exactly where he is. But Chuck Lawless is helping us lead an initiative called the Hope Initiative, which is helping churches to wed prayer and evangelism to create a culture of gospel culture of inviting people and people coming to know Christ. Well, that I would have to have a team of fifty to have done that at Lifeway. Chuck's basically doing this on his own right now. So my point is, yeah, one person in these churches, we got to come up with a name. Normative, maybe not, maybe small. I don't know. We'll come up with some other name. But this specifically, as I talk about Chuck's involvement in the Hope Initiative, this is one way that your church can go from non-evangelistic to evangelistic with one or a few. It doesn't take much. Good. That's so good. You know, we do have a, a there is a, a movement, uh, a campaign some churches use called Who's Your One? And that's sort of thinking yeah. along those lines. And Who's Your One? Just this year, pick out one person that doesn't know Christ and you're praying for that person in your life. And uh, you commit to pray for that Who's Your One and to find ways to enter gospel conversations with just that one. I like the idea that that's a manageable size kind of thing. We're not trying to get big to huge numbers again. We're just doing the the one which is really important. So the same kind of thing. I like that a lot. Well, the the Hope Initiative is a few people in your church. It may be two or three. We'd like for the pastor to be involved in it. They have a 30-day guide, and they go through that 30 days, and they have very specific instructions. A good portion of it is praying, and some of it is getting out in the community and going by homes and praying for them but it's very manageable and it can be done with a few people. I mean, two or three people can do the hope initiative in a church. So moving obediently into evangelism, whether it's who's your one, invite your one hope initiative, it can be done with a few. And yeah, I think we need some evangelistic fire in, in our churches today. Pack, pack, Mark, pack a few, pack, pack a pew night. That would be okay too. Yeah, yeah, I remember those days. <laughs> I don't know what we'd do if we had chairs instead of pews, but I know it doesn't work, you know. I don't know, but we always had pack a pew night where you would be given a you would personally this I'm going way back, but we'd have these revival meetings. This is way back kind of with thing. Mark Clifton. Get ready way for this when, one. And and it would be a pack a pew night, you would be assigned a pew. All right. And your job was to fill that pew with people who don't come to church. Now that right. sounds kind of corny. You pack a pew night, and then you got a, you got an award if you filled if your pew was filled. You got it now. You got you know noticed that night. But you know, I was I was thinking about that the other day. You know, I, you know, I don't know. I wouldn't recommend we do that again. But the point was, there was impetus then for one person to fill a pew. Go you one person. Yeah. You you can you can bring your friends. You can and many times in the larger the church gets, the less one person feels like they have anything they can really make a difference in. So I think that's exactly. what I'm trying to say. And so right. the, the action is one person can make a difference. There's power in one. There's particularly in evangelism because an evangelistic church can just have one evangelistic person. It should have more, but it can just have one evangelistic person in it. Okay. Also, another action shift in a small church, you can find one, maybe two specific needs in the community and you can laser focus on that. And you can be known as the church that fills in the blank, right? Oh, oh, so true. Run to your strengths, man. Find out what some of the needs are in that community and then make it your job to meet those needs, to be the, the church that responds to that. Absolutely. And one of the best ways to find the needs in your community is to is to look across social media. Every community has a Facebook community for your neighborhood or for your school system or for man. Follow that and see what people say. I, I see all the time on our Facebook community. Someone will say, you know, my husband's coming home from the hospital. Uh, he, we need a ramp built in our front porch. You know, can anybody know someone who can help us do that? 
I mean, that's the kind of things that a small church, a normally sized church should be all over. Just looking at social media and seeing who mm. in your community you can minister to and you can help all kinds of ways to do that. So absolutely. I mean, I could I could do a whole podcast on how a normative sized church like ours of 40 or 50 people, uh, how we have this ministry footprint that way is bigger than the church size we have. Our footprint in our community, far, far larger than you would look at a church of 40, including children, by the way, that's 40, including kids, 40 or 50. Our, our, our impact, our footprint in that community is far larger than churches that maybe are four or 500 in attendance would have. And I'm not exaggerating that. And I can back it up. I mean, it, if, if a normative sized church will really lean toward loving and being, uh, incarnational in the community and connected the community. There's so many ways people, people will talk to you in a small church. They're, they're not intimidated by the church. It, it, it seems much more approachable than a huge mega church, you know, or even a larger church. And so we've get people in the community that just approach our, our own members and say, Hey, we know you help people. Here's something I heard needs to be done. And when that begins, it becomes like a, like a flywheel. It begins with just one person tells another person tells another person. And it is an exciting place to be when you see God working among a, a normative sized church. It is not unlike the loaves and the fishes where you take this little tiny church and you go, I don't know where this is coming from, but we just keep helping people and keep helping people and keep helping people. And this shouldn't work this way, but, but it does. And uh, when was the last time I want you guys to ask yourself this question. When was the last time in your church, you looked at something, you said, only God could have done that. There's no other mm. no other answer for it. And, you know, when you're a normative sized church, you're in that situation a lot. We're in a huge church with a lot of money and a lot of staff. It's a little harder sometimes to say only God could have done that. You know, we got this big building. We got millions of dollars. We got great staff. But, man, when it's just, you know, me and about 40 people and some really amazing things happen, you go, man, only only God could have done that. So. I like being, the way, you can tell I like being in a smaller church. Yes, you do. By the way, Church Answers has a great resource. We'll put it in the show notes called Know Your Community. And it's an incredible yes. report that talks about the needs of the community. Yeah, it talks about the demographics, age, race, ethnicity, uh, marital status, those kind of things. But it also talks about the needs of the community. So uh, we'll put we'll put that in the show notes for you uh, as as well. So uh, go go back to your current church, Mark. Um, yep, you're, you're talking about it 40, 40 something now attending. Talk about what appeared to be the hopeless state. You've told the story before, but I want the audience to hear it again. Where were they <laughs> yeah, it, four years yeah, ago? In May of in May of 2020, so not even three years ago, uh, as we do this podcast. Uh, there were three remaining members uh, active. And uh, when I say active, I mean, that's all we could get to come. We, we, they were having a meeting to vote to whether to keep the church open or close the church. They sent letters to every member. Three, there had only been about three or four that had been attending for about a year. And these were th three remaining members. And uh, they could have voted, to, and they did. They initially were going to vote to sell the church building and give the money to other organizations. But uh, the real estate agent that was listing the building called me, and I set up a meeting with them. And a long story short, I, I agreed. I asked if I could come be their pastor at no pay. And uh, they had to think about that for a while, whether they wanted to die or have me as their pastor. It took about two weeks, seriously. But they eventually said, well, you know, I guess kind of the, oh, what do we got to lose kind of thing. But they, no, they, they agreed. So my wife and I went and uh, been there now for almost three years. And we, 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 we've had as many as 65 or 70. Uh, Christmas Eve, probably 100. Easter, probably 100. So, I mean, when I say 40 or 50, that's every week, which means probably our ministry group is closer to 65 or 70. You know how that goes. So about that, that's right. about how many we have. Members, about only about 30, 35 members. Uh, so we have a lot of people who are attending that aren't members, and that's exciting. Uh, we've baptized 12 in the last two and a half years. Mm. That's pretty exciting. And we're beginning to really uh, have a huge impact on our community. We've we've done uh, four huge citywide events. Now, our city is 400 people. So, you know, <laughs> but but four we, we've done the we've done two big bluegrass music festivals uh, where we closed down Main Street. They let us close down Main you Street. You would do bluegrass. Leave it to you. I would have yeah, I would have had 60s do. bands. You do bluegrass. Yeah. We've done uh, two uh, Christmas festivals where we had a nighttime uh, Christmas parade. We bring in Santa Claus. We light the mayor's Christmas tree. We bring in musicians. Um, 
we, we have, those have had five or 600 people attending those things in a town of 400 people obviously come from outside of town. I mean, this is it, what we've been able to, what God's been able to accomplish through this little tiny church, if you want to call it that, compared to what people, many people would call it, is, is far outweighs its, its seeming size. And mm. that is just so exciting to see God do something uh, with something that other people would say is, it'd be easy to sit there and say, well, we can't do any of that because we're just 35 members. But I tell you what, you get 35 members who really want to follow Christ, who really want to be his church in the town. That's a, there's nothing more powerful on earth than that, period. Oh, absolutely. Don't forget that. All right. We are talking about the rise of the small church. And if you did not listen or watch the previous episode, episode 288, where we talked about the attitudes that need to shift on this, boy, so many nuggets there. Just go back and listen to that. And once again, listen to Mark Clifton on normal speed. You've got to hear it in its <laughs> autographer, in its original form. And then <sighs> in t- this episode 289, we're talking about the rise of the small church, things that the church can do. Uh, we talked about how one or few people can can make a big difference. We talked about how evangelism can be revived with just a few people. We've talked about Mark did an incredible job of find out what the needs of the community are and go to social media, go to their Facebook page, get a know your uh, know your community report. There's just many I'll ways a, to do that. Yeah, I mean, real quick, have a free garage sale. That's the first thing we did. We asked churches across our county to bring their junk to our lawn on a Thursday afternoon. And then on social media, we put out there that we're going to have everything is free. Just come and take it. And Seriously, we didn't give them sacks. We didn't line them up. We just said, if you want it, you can come take it. And by the way, that's a really good way to clean out the church's flower room, too, because we put all the silk (laughs) flowers. But anyway, and so that was on on Friday and Saturday. And we even did it on Sunday morning. We we moved church outside that Sunday morning. So we were having church outside on one side of the building. Heretic, heretic. And the free free garage sale was outside on the other side of the building. So people were coming to the free garage sale. Then they'd walk around the building. They could see us having church over there. But at the free garage sale, we learned so much about our community. And and we learned about their needs, who lived where. We live down at this house. We need this. We need a table. Do you have a couch? It was amazing. It was a lady who moved in across, literally, catty corner across the street from the church. She just got her brother's house, and she didn't have any furniture. And she came over and said, what do you have? And I know one of our men said, we have three couches. We have two kitchen tables. We have a TV. She took all that, and our guys moved it in and put it in her house for her. I mean, they wow. walked it from our church property over there. Do a free garage sale. It is such a cool thing. Uh, anyway, I, I digress. But that's how we kind of learned. You're not really, that was our first. And, and we set up a table over here where there was a our, our food bank in the county was there. And because people would say, we want to give you money. And we'd say, no, you're going to understand that this church will never take money from the community. We are not here to feed off the community. We will not take your money. But then many of them will say, well, I'm not going to take this couch unless I can give some money for it. So we'd say, sure, over here is the harvester's table. Uh, they are the food bank for Lynn- Leavenworth County. Go ahead and give the money to them, but don't give it to us. People then begin to get a whole new view of who the church is. And mm. uh, I, anyway, so whatever. That's no, not whatever, first. Mark. That's total gold. Ah, uh, I mean, if there there are probably three fifty four hundred thousand churches in the United States alone, of the uh, of those three hundred sixty three hundred seventy thousand are under two fifty, and uh, two hundred thousand are probably under two hundred. I could go on and on with the numbers there, but my point is, if every church heard some of these gold nuggets and the attitude and the actions, boy, it can make a huge difference. It really could. So, quit, quit, that'll quit go saying a lot you're further. talking too much. That'll go a lot further to clean up. That will go a lot further to clean up a bad reputation than changing your name on a sign. I'm telling you, giving people free stuff and loving on them will go a lot further than just saying we're now called something else. Trust me, been down that road. I, I wonder. If all the churches that have been don't have had upright pianos donated to them, if they could then recycle them in the community. I think I told you this, Mark. A pastor sent a photo of a church that was on their fifth or sixth donated upright piano, and it was in the men's room. They said they hadn't had no other place to put it. So I, I think that's finally working its way out. You're right. 20 years ago, 
every Sunday school room had an upright piano in it. And nobody wants an upright piano. You can't give those things away. So, yeah, that, that is hilarious. Although you can repurpose them. Go to Etsy and see how you can take the guts out of them. You can make bookcases out of them. Now, that's what you should do. If you've got upright pianos in your church and you're in a normative-sized church, go to the website, go to Pinterest, find out ways you can repurpose upright pianos, get some of your guys to take the guts out, make bookcases out of them, make and then, and then sell them and give the money to uh, to some organization in your city. That's how you can deal with upright pianos. Just thought I'd share. Uh, we'll, we'll put a bow on the rise of the small church. Remember, part one was attitudinal shifts. Part two was action shift, this particular episode. Uh, we've talked about how one or few can make a difference. We've talked about how evangelism can be turned around with just a few. Uh, Mark gave us some gold nuggets about finding and meeting the needs of the community. And just the last thing we want to say as we t- put a bow on all of this in action, be consistent. Do something, you know, think think about something little that you can do every single month. It doesn't have to be a major program, but just be consistent in doing so. And you can watch your church make a huge difference. Mark, we've done a lot of podcasts together. And i got to say, yes. these last two have been some of the most fun for me because your your excursions have now been cruise liner ships. So it is, it has been really, really good. So, so thank you for sharing all of that. Thank you. And we are, we're, we're spinning off another podcast from this. Uh, Tom and talk I have been to, together. Talk to us about it. We've been together since the late 1960s doing this. And so uh, we're, we're going to, we're going to, so we're going to spin off. Uh, and so we're going to, we are uh, beginning in March or so revitalize and replant. Uh, I'll take that title and uh, you can you can subscribe to that. It'll be a brand new podcast. So you have to subscribe to it. And uh, Tom and I'll still be talking to each other and on each other's podcast. But we're, we're going to go. And I've got uh, Mark Halleck, who is the replant pastor in Denver, Colorado. Mark has been part of replanting 30 churches across the mountain states. And mm. a friend of mine named Dan Hurst, who is an amazing voice talent and, and pastor. Uh, I say voice talent. Dude, man, he has. Uh, this guy has done voiceover work, still does, for major motion pictures and major food chains. You'll hear him on Jill and I are sitting home the other night and go, oh, that's Dan. Well, that's Dan. Great guy, loves Jesus, uh, loves the local church. He's he's going to be the sort of the, the announcer and the, the questioner, and uh, Mark and I are going to take his questions. It's going to be fun. Now, here's how you can learn about it. You can go to revitalizeandreplant.com. And you can listen to the pilot episode. Now, it's a pilot episode. So trust me, you know how it is. The pilot episode of Seinfeld was not nearly as good as later on in the year. So give us, <laughs> cut us some slack. But, but, but go listen to our pilot episode and then subscribe to the pilot episode. And you can be a charter subscriber, like a charter member of a church. So that's a really exciting thing you could do is become a, a charter subscriber. And uh, we're going to give away a trip to the Holy Land for the first five subscribe. Well, Sorry, they just, that was the last one. We just gave the last one away. So too late. So cruel. You're too so late. Cruel. Okay, that's it. So, so again, though that information is in the show notes. Uh, revitalize, revitalize and Replant will be moving to another location. Go there, listen to it. It's going to be some great stuff. Mm-hmm. We're going to be right here. We'll be renamed the Church Answers Podcast, so right at this location. So stay with us here. But also, you can go here to podcasts. You can go here, Mark. You can go here, Tom. You can put Mark on normal speed because I have my <laughs> drawling Southern accent. You can put me on 1.5 and it'll sound normal. So thank you so much for being a part of Revitalize and Replant. We've loved talking about the smaller church, even though we are questioning the wisdom of using the adjective, but we've been talking about churches that represent churches historically in the world. Thank you for being here. We'll see you in the next episode. 